Hey guys, and welcome back to the channel. Many of you have asked me for my take on cyberpsychosis, the condition affecting edge runners in the cyberpunk universe. So, in today's video, following the character Main, we're going to be looking at cyberpsychosis and how it compares to psychosis in the real world. I'm going to be explaining some of the neuroscience behind the symptoms of psychosis, and we're going to look at some of the treatments out there that help to bring people back to reality. Now, there are going to be some big spoilers ahead for those who haven't seen the series yet, so viewers beware. Otherwise, if you're ready, let's begin. Okay, so first up we see this guy's mantis blade come up against Main's arm cannon. And I have to say how cool these mantis blades look. I can imagine in the future we'd be able to create something like this. For example, imagine if you were an amputee, I could imagine them creating a prosthetic that would look like this. All you really needed to do is to be able to expand and then contract again. And considering how advanced some of the prosthetics are becoming, this does look like something they could achieve. And then again, looking at Maine's general physique, it's quite difficult to know where his human body ends and his cyberware starts. And when I think whether a full bionic body might be achievable, I just think back to the Hacksmith YouTube channel. I remember watching a video where they made a full bionic arm, and I'll leave a link for that video down below. <laughs> Okay, and this scene is pretty cool where Main takes on more of a mental role for David. And he tells him that for his body to keep up with the San Davistan spinal implant, he's going to need to upgrade his chrome. And I have suspected this and discussed it in my previous video where we spoke to the limitations of human tendons, ligaments and muscles compared to cybernetic implants. I mean, I'm just relating it to the types of things that I see as a doctor. Repetitive heavy use of different parts of the body can result in things like tendonitis or muscular sprains or strains. A few common ones are things like golfers or tennis elbow, and I see lots of injuries where people have damaged their rotator cuff muscles. So I can imagine that updating those human parts to mechanical structures will allow you to break free from your human limitations. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure if those are immunomodulators that he's shooting up here or if there's something like a stimulant. But by the way he was reacting, you'd think he was using it to get high, as I don't typically see my patients do this when they take their immunosuppressants. Now I have to say, watching this scene again after completing the series, it holds a different meaning. You can really see how it goes on to define David's character for the rest of the series, as he models himself on Maine's physicality and persona. Maine. Okay, so we now pick up a little later on in the series where we see that Main is beginning to lose touch with reality, but only to the extent of what appears to be daydreaming, which we're all capable of. But what is the science behind daydreaming? Well, when you're daydreaming, your brain switches between two different operating systems. You have your primary operating network, and then you have your one for daydreaming called the default network. Now this default network uses different parts of the brain compared to the primary one. These include the medial prefrontal cortex, which helps to imagine ourselves and the thoughts and feelings of others, the posterior cingulate cortex, which shows personal memories from the brain, and the parietal cortex, which has connections to the hippocampus that stores your memories. Now, the default network is only activated when you switch your conscious mind from attention demanding tasks to wandering or daydreaming. And it's for this reason that this network is considered our default setting. So basically, when our brain isn't paying attention to the present, it reverts to using this setting. A bit like a screensaver. Now, one really interesting product of this system is something called stimulus independent thought. And what these are are thoughts that aren't about things in our external environment where our creative imagination can run away with itself. And an example of this is Maine's thoughts transporting him to running in the desert. Maine? 
Okay, and this is where things get a little bit more concerning, as it doesn't appear as though this is just benign daydreaming. In a situation where Maine's brain ought to be focused and paying attention, utilising that primary operating network, it seems to be dysfunctioning, showing in what appears to be visual hallucinations. And really, this is one of the significant signs that Maine is beginning to lose touch with reality. But what is the science behind hallucinations? Well, the first thing to say is that we're all capable of experiencing hallucinations if we're exposed to the right stimulus. Now, the definition of a hallucination is where you see, hear, smell or feel something that appears to be real but only actually exists in your mind. Now, our brain is pretty good at distinguishing between images or sounds that are occurring in our outside environment and those that are occurring in our mind. But occasionally, something can go wrong. And one major theory about the origin of hallucinations is that something goes wrong between the relationship from the frontal lobe and your sensory cortex. For example, research suggests that the auditory hallucinations that patients with schizophrenia suffer from is due to an overactive auditory cortex, which is part of the brain that processes sound. And as a result of this overactivity, random sounds and speech fragments get generated that patients perceive as voices speaking to them. Similarly, patients with Parkinson's disease appear to have an overactive visual cortex which results in the generation of images in the brain of things that aren't actually there. And it's also thought that psychoactive drugs or psychedelics also work by disrupting this relationship between the sensory processing parts of the brain and the frontal lobe. And therefore, I wonder whether it's Maine's exposure to the side effect of chrome seeping out into his bloodstream, as well as the effects of the immunomodulators, which are disrupting these processes in his brain. And so the condition has worsened here as clearly Maine's brain has become dysfunctional. Not only is he losing contact with reality, but it appears as though he has no conscious memory of what he's doing during an episode. And this can be a common experience of those people suffering with an acute psychotic episode, where they have very little memory of what's occurring. Often people can't believe or imagine that they would have said or done the things they've done during an episode, which almost makes them feel as though they've been possessed. And it's thought that memory is affected this way because despite us thinking that the brain is broken down into its own separate functioning units, all different parts of the brain need to be working together to give a real life conscious experience. If one part of the brain crashes, the whole system becomes dysfunctional. So here, Doria confirms that Maine does have cyberpsychosis. Now, in the cyberpunk universe, they define this as a dissociative identity disorder brought on by an overload of cybernetic augmentation. Also, it's typically characterized by outbursts and psychotic behavior, often including violence towards other people in the cyberpsychosis sufferer's surroundings. And I guess that's where it differs from real-world psychosis, where patients tend to be a greater risk to themselves with alcohol abuse, drug misuse, or even self-harm and suicide. And for the sufferer, I can imagine this must be a really disorientating experience, not knowing which reality you can trust and hence the reason why we need to identify these people earlier and get them some treatment. And this scene shows one of the big character flaws of Maine. He may well have been able to have slowed down the progression or possibly reversed the effects of cyberpsychosis by downgrading his chrome. However, his ego wouldn't allow him to. But are there specific risk factors for the development of psychotic episodes? Well, research has shown that it's due to a complex interplay between our genetic factors and environmental stressors. But psychosis can also be triggered in anyone if they go through a traumatic experience, an overwhelming amount of stress, they abuse drugs, they suffer from alcohol misuse. It can also result as a side effect of medication or a physical condition such as a brain tumour. 
Interestingly, studies that have looked at personality traits as risk factors for psychosis have shown that neuroticism is positively correlated with psychotic experiences. On the other hand, however, extroversion, openness, agreeableness and conscientiousness have been shown as personality traits that are almost protective of psychotic experiences. And that's really interesting with how Maine's been depicted as a character. He's more of a stoic leader who the whole team can depend upon. But when he comes into a bad situation, he closes himself off and becomes more of an introvert. There's an argument to say that had he been a bit more open and extroverted, he may have been able to avoid his final fate. And here again we see that Maine is caught in an almost daydream state with his visual hallucinations. And it's interesting seeing that his hallucinations revolve around him being by himself in the desert alone, as research has found that the nature of a person's hallucinations tend to be consistent with what's going on internally with their own mental state. For example, those going through a psychotic depression have a tendency to hear derogatory auditory hallucinations, whereas those who are going through a manic psychosis tend to hear voices whose content is congruent with their elevated mood. So I appreciate I'm not a psychoanalyst, but what this scene might be showing us is that deep down, Maine might have felt lost, alone and isolated with the way that he was feeling. I'll leave the rest of the analysis for you guys down in the comments. Okay, so here I can see that Doria is giving Maine some of what I can only assume are his immunomodulators that will help with the cyberpsychosis. Now, I'm not 100% sure on the fictional neuroscience behind cyberpsychosis, but I've speculated in my previous videos that it might be a combination of the cyberware leaching out into his bloodstream, depositing heavy metals into his brain, as well as the brain being overwhelmed by the amount of neurological feedback you receive from your cybernetic implants. Now, we know how they manage this in the cyberpunk universe, but how do we treat psychosis in the real world? Well, we do have medications called antipsychotics, which work by moderating the level of dopamine in the brain. Now, dopamine is a neurochemical which is thought to be imbalanced and implicated in the development of many of the different psychotic symptoms. The unfortunate thing about antipsychotic medications is that they don't get to work straight away and can take several weeks to help with your psychotic symptoms. Other therapies that might be of benefit are psychological therapies, the main one being cognitive behavioural therapy. Now what this does is that it looks to help people to make sense of their experiences so that they can better cope with them and experience less distress. It's just it doesn't look like Maine has the time just now to sit down and go through a psychotherapy session. David, David. <laughs> <laughs> I like this, this is pretty cool. So in the event of you sustaining a life-threatening injury, a trauma team are dispatched to save your life. I guess we have something similar now where elderly patients have a necklace with an installed alarm system. If they fall over at home, they press this button which alerts the emergency services of their fall. Sure, it won't trigger a SWAT team to come to your house, but at least it will get you some help. Okay, Maine is really deteriorating rapidly here, with him attacking any perceived threat in his environment. Let's not forget that hallucinations occur as a result of false perceptions of your environment. And so the fact that we see Maine shooting at Doria should be no surprise as he's falsely perceiving her as his enemy. And at this stage, it's probably too high of a risk to be around Maine, as he's likely going through a fight or flight response at the same time as trying to decide what was a true reality. Gosh, and so this finally culminates in Maine accidentally killing Doria, and this is probably the worst possible scenario for Maine, as he treasures his crew above everything else. 
Now, speaking earlier about the risks that patients with psychosis pose, it's really more towards themselves with high levels of self-harm and suicide. But patients can normally list protective factors that prevent them from acting out these thoughts of self-harm. And these include things like having family and friends or good supportive networks. But on the other hand, there are also precipitating factors such as drug or alcohol abuse, relationship issues, or death of a family or friend. With this in mind, I wouldn't be surprised if Maine felt like he had nothing left to lose and went on a rampage to try and claim his revenge, even at the cost of his own life. Hey, I'm... Yeah, and this was a pretty bad scene with David to see Maine at his lowest, unraveled by the effects of cyber psychosis. Remembering that Maine was the one that David looked up to and modeled himself on, I can imagine that this would either shatter David's sense of identity or motivate him further to succeed where Maine failed. Gosh, Maine was really like an older brother to David here. He recognised that David was afraid and with his final act selflessly tells him to leave. But it is interesting as recent research has shown that trauma in early life is one of the greatest predictors of poor mental health with it basically doubling your risk of developing all forms of mental health condition. So adding this to the fact that David follows a similar path to Maine in upgrading his cyberware in Chrome, it's no surprise that he also goes on to develop cyber psychosis. <laughs> God, and what a way to go, at his own hands rather than at the hands of his enemy. I mean, I'm surprised that he made it to this point with the amount of bullets that he took in the earlier scenes. But it's a shame that the anime didn't delve into Maine's backstory to better understand his journey and motivations as an edge runner, as he looks like he might have had a similar origin story to David's. And as promised, David gets away with Maine's arm cannon, a symbol of his old mentor. And the animation shows really well how traumatised David is by all of this, as he sheds a tear. I don't blame him. Okay guys, if you've enjoyed today's video and you want to see more, I've created a further playlist on my channel where we've looked at Adam Smasher and David's cyberware implants. Otherwise, any other recommendations for future videos, please leave those down in the comments below. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.